All right, we are now recording. And we're going to go live on Facebook. Just takes a minute for it to process. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. We're here um, with San Pedro's Facebook Live and our live Zoom webinar. We have with us today, Mr. Henry Fortier, who is the superintendent of Catholic schools and also the head of the Secretariat for Education. And we are gonna do a conversation. We're gonna continue a series of conversations that we've been doing here um, through San Pedro. Um, Kimmy Zeiler has been doing them, but I'm taking over this one. And what we've been doing is engaging with different uh, ministry leaders throughout the diocese around what the work for them has been like since we've been in this pandemic and in this kind of new environment where we've had to figure out all these ways to minister virtually to maintain the safety of others, um, and all the complications and realities that that has brought for folks doing ministry throughout the diocese. So today we wanted to talk with someone from our school's community and who better than the guy in charge. And so um, Henry has agreed to throw, even though he has the craziest schedule of any human being I know, except for probably the bishop, um, Henry has agreed to sit in with us and spend a little time and just go over some of his experiences. Thanks for joining us, Henry. Thank you for having me, Isabel. All right, we're just going to start with a brief opening prayer. I'm going to keep it simple. We're just going to say a Hail Mary together, and then we will get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. With all that thunder and lightning, I, I think I've had a kind of day where I could use mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, be, that being part of the issue, we do have crazy weather today, so it's entirely possible we'll lose this whole broadcast and have to start over. But you know, we'll try, right, Henry? Yes, all things are possible. All right. Yeah, anything can happen. We'll be, we'll be fine. Um, so basically, the way we've been doing these conversations is just to have you guys who are in leadership share a little bit about some of the experiences you've been having. So what do you, like, some folks have no idea what the superintendent of schools does. And on top of the fact that you're also the head of the Secretariat for Education. So can you kind of give us an overview of what, things you're kind of touching and, and dealing with in a week? Sure. Um, I'll do the umbrella role as Secretary of Education. Um, in that role, I kind of have three d distinct departments. And the first role, um, and probably the most demanding, is the role of Superintendent of Catholic Schools. And in the Diocese of Orlando, we have uh, 43 schools with about 14,500 students located in eight counties in Central Florida. Um, ma majority of them are parish elementary schools. We have five high schools and then a small number of early childhood centers that um, are scattered throughout our region. In my position, I also oversee um, the operations at San Pedro Center. So I work with the community there for programming needs, construction. Um, and so this has dramatically impacted San Pedro as well as the schools. And in my third role, I oversee the mission office, which uh, our, our sister diocese is in the Dominican Republic, the Diocese of San Juan de la Maguana. And of course that has had a dramatic impact as well in our sister diocese because all uh, travel, all missioners, all projects that we've had have come to kind of a halt. So there, in every area of my secretariat, this pandemic has kind of thrown everything up in the air from what it used to be. So from that first uh, communication to my parents in the schools, which was February 28th, letting them know that we're monitoring the situation. At that time, we had no confirmed cases in Florida but that we were preparing for what might come 
in looking at what was occurring in Europe at that time, and Italy was on the rise and it hadn't gotten to the UK yet, but we knew what happened in China. We saw what was happening in Italy, the tragedy there. We knew it was just uh, a matter of time because of the, the level of contagion and uh, just how quickly it was spreading. So from that point on, in all three of my departments that I oversee, we began just radical planning. Um, and so for the role of superintendent, we cover everything from um, teacher contracts to setting curriculum to safety standards to operation budgets, um, everything that's entailed in running a school from day to day. And um, the principals, of course, were very concerned. We had many parents uh, calling and asking for direction. And so those frequent regular communications were critical. There's, there was tremendous anxiety at the beginning of this. And it's, it's kind of interesting how the pendulum swings because at the beginning of it, there was such high anxiety. And this past weekend, you kind of saw the pendulum swinging the other way where people were like, okay, I'm done with exerting anxiety over this. I just want to feel normal and people wanting to go back out and um, I would say pretend like it's normal because you know it's not yeah. we're not out of this yet and so the reality is this is with us for a while but those regular communications in the beginning to help our parents understand um, we we are well aware of the situation we're aware of the impact that this can have and the life-threatening danger this presents to our students as well as our teachers and that we were preparing um, for our mission office it was kind of we need to shut down operations as safely as possible while still uh, meeting the needs of our communities down there. We have pending water projects for nine communities that don't have regular access or to clean water or any water that, for that matter. We had a um, housing project that is staged and ready to go to build uh, 40 new homes in an area called La Cueva, which is very remote and they are living in um, tin and wood shacks for quality of life and health. We also had our regular education missions going down. So all that kind of came to a halt while securing our operations there and keeping our missioners safe who go down. And for San Pedro, um, San Pedro is a spiritual development center. So its very existence has been on gathering large groups of people together to learn about God yeah. to, you know, kind of, you know, develop themselves spiritually. So when you have guidelines that say, you know, you cannot have more than six people in a space, it kind of impacts the operations of San Pedro dramatically. So um, that had to get retooled very quickly. So with all of those operations, there was um, immediate action that needed to be taken. And, um, you know, it, it can be very overwhelming. There's a lot there that happened in a very short period of time. Well, I'm exhausted just listening to all of that. Um, it's very overwhelming, like, because when you think about each entity having all of its own moving parts and then all the people that are connected to that, um, and full disclosure, everybody, I work for Henry, <laughs> so both at the Office of Schools and at San Pedro. Um, so I know a little bit about what goes on. And what's interesting to me is like from your position, like the reason for this whole ministering to the ministers concept is, you know, how do those who are in leadership, because it's very, it's not usual that you're dealing with students, for example, you're dealing with everybody who's running it. And then those people are touching the teachers and at San Pedro, same thing, you know, you're, you're overseeing, but you're not the one in as much direct contact. So how does the a situation like this complicate that, you know, that communication structure that you have to have for people? Well, I mean, and, and you're right, you know, as I, when I first began my ministry in Catholic education as a teacher, you know, I was with the students every day. So it was direct, constant contact. And then as you yeah. move to principal, you, that contact gets more limited because you're dealing with parents and teachers more 
And then as I became associate superintendent and superintendent, the distance becomes greater. So you're working mm -hmm. directly with principals now and teachers once in a while. So the, your impact broadens, but your direct contact mm -hmm. with those you are really serving um, distances. And so that's why it's important for me um, in normal times that I'm out in schools as much as possible. Um, I have never in my 10 year or nine years here as superintendent spent this much time in the office. Um, and, you know, it's a different world right now, but normally I am out in the field and in the schools because I need to be connected to those I'm serving. I need to see it. So how are your, well, and, and that's where I was kind of going with that question is, so then how are, how do you assess how everybody's coping? Like, how are your people doing? How are the folks in the mission in you know, the San Pedro center and then also in the schools, how, how do you take a pulse of how everybody's doing and how everybody's coping? Well, I, you know, we are, we are physically distanced, but given where we're at, you know, if this pandemic hit 100 years ago, it would be a very different circumstance. But given the technology we have today, there is absolutely no reason for me to not be in constant communication with the people I'm serving. So, you know, my life is in front of a computer like I am right now. Um, I've, you know, I made sure there's no piles of stuff behind me to so that visually people don't see the the chaos on the side of me over here. But, you know, it's, it's now being present to them virtually. So I do Zoom meetings with my principals by region on a regular basis. I am FaceTiming my staff for the mission office. I've got one in Columbia and, you know, people are spread out in different locations, but we have our staff meetings there. I'm texting and communicating with our families when there's signal on the mountain to see, you know, has the virus spread up into the, Lom the, the Lomas, the central mountain region there in the Dominican Republic and how the families are doing. Um, has, it with those remote, has it actually reached those remote areas? I'm sorry to interrupt those. Um, no, they, it's very difficult because uh, back on- I know they're very isolated up there, so. They are extremely isolated, but once things get up there, it's very difficult because without regular running water for washing hands and hygiene, things spread very quickly there. So, um, you know, there have been cases where people have been sick, but because there's no testing up on the mountain, there's no way to know who has what. Um, mm -hmm. And at one point, I believe it was around the 12th of April, they were suspending testing for a period of time in the entire country. Wow. So there were, there's many challenges, you know, in that location, but, you know, I'm constantly trying to stay connected to find out what's happening, you know, where are the anxieties. And with our principals, I have a very open diet with any of my employees and people that I work with, um, or people that I serve, I'd like to say, remind myself <laughs> that, you know, they can say what they need to say. I, I want to hear the truth. I don't want to hear, you know, something that's going to make me feel good. Because if I'm going to serve them, I need to know what is their anxiety level. So after the first two, three weeks, the principals were, were telling me, okay, the teachers are experiencing a lot of anxiety. You know, they, are, they haven't learned yet how to set boundaries in a virtual world. And so they're right. working extensive hours and feeling drained. Um, they were doing an amazing job. The, I've never received so much positive feedback from parents, but quickly that helped me to understand I need to send out guidance to the teachers that it's okay to turn that computer off at a certain time, to learn how to create a work world within a virtual world. It's easier to do when you drive off the campus. It's yeah. not so easy when the campus is inside your living room. Well, I think that um, for a lot of folks, especially teachers, they, they have a habit of kind of working all the time because they, they grade at home a lot of times or, you know, there's, they already have kind of fuzzy boundaries. So this was just, must have been chaotic for people to be like, oh my gosh, now my work is fully at home. How do I split it up? It, it's very well, hard. And especially when you're assigning work to students 
and there, you're not collecting it physically in a classroom so that you have all, you know, 28 exams to review. Those now, those exams now may trickle in over three days, not exams, but, you know, assignments. I trickle yeah. in over two, three days. So the teachers constantly have work flowing in and out. Parents, you know, wanting answers immediately. Um, and because we were trying to be considerate, we, you know, we have families where mom was at home working on her computer. We have three students in our schools. They have one computer. If we need right. to lend an extra computer, but the demand on the computers at home became, you know, very, very real. And so we had to allow for time expansion of assignments. So all of a sudden a teacher might get from four kids, 50 assignments over the weekend and then the parent is texting saying when is my child's grade going to be in right so helping to create those boundaries it has been very unique um very challenging but also i think it it gave the teachers the opportunity to to learn to say no which we all have to do yeah it's important and and from a and from in like a leadership perspective you know i know like I know from working for, with you that you are open to hearing people um, out and to listening to what they have to say. But I know also that it's difficult because there's a barrage. There's like so much volume right now of inputs and outputs coming in and out. You're having to communicate with parents directly. You're having to communicate with your principals, the staff at the center, the people on the mountain. <laughs> like it's, there's just a lot of kind of in and out. So how, how, um, how would you tell others who are either in similar positions or part of a system like that, like ours in the diocese where there's so much kind of coming in and out, like how have you kind of managed that input and output for yourself so that you don't, you know, you're, you look like a totally sane person right now, which is some kind of act of will and, and grace. So how did you, how do you do that so that other people who have similar struggles know how to, how you're doing it? Well, I think grace is the number one. Um, you know, my routine has changed since the pandemic each morning. Um, you know, I do come into the office, but you know, no one in my department comes into the office. They work from home and many in the chancery building work from home. But for me mentally, it was important to create a routine that would, um, allow me to create a rhythm in my life that continues that sense of peace and groundedness. So early on, I decided, you know, because there's social distancing with like five people in the building versus 200, um, you know, I was able to do that and that gave me a routine. And even for people who work from home, creating that space where you work and not just plopping the computer in the middle of the living room because you need to be able to create those barriers and boundaries for yourself. Also, um, I go down to the kitchen first thing in the morning and I like to drink water all day. So I get a bucket of ice from the ice machine um, and right there next to the kitchen is the chapel. So I always stop in the chapel first thing. Um, that is my time to just take a moment let my anxieties run free, let my fears run free, let my <laughs> insecurities, all of those things that every human being has run free and wild in the presence of God. Um, and just say, okay, they're yours. And it's easier said than done, but it can be done. And then yeah. getting upstairs and getting to work. And for me, those rhythms in the morning, um, you know, my secretary came in today, Phyllis, and she said, oh, I got your ice. I said, uh-oh, you screwed up my rhythm. And she laughed and she said, well, I was here today. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I still got to go take my walk. I said, I need, mm -hmm. I need my morning time with Jesus. So, you know, I went down to the chapel and just kind of took my, you know, sometimes it's just a few quick short minutes because I've got to get up to a Zoom meeting or calls. Um, sometimes it may be 15 minutes or more, but that time to silence and enter into solitude and just still yourself is so critical when there is so much chaos spinning around you. 
if I don't do that, I will be caught in the chaos and I will be good for nobody. Um, it will drain the <laughs> life out of me. Well, it's so, like, um, what's like they say, universal precautions, you got to take care so that you can actually help the other people around you. You um, cannot minister. Well, you can't minister to people unless you minister to yourself too. And for me, after work, exercise, it's important. Get out, even if it's speed walking or me, you know, a bad form of jogging where I, you know, kind of clunk along, I'm not a runner, but something that also <laughs> clears my mind and just kind of resets my day, um, it's important. I think people forget that um, discipline provides freedom. If you have some kind of structure, however minimal it is you can manage to create within your space. And, and I just know, like I've talked to people, my, you know, my kids are running around and my this and my that. And it's like, yeah, but whatever basic minimal structure you can create in your space gives you the freedom then to operate within that. And I, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if I pick up a, a, a saxophone and start just messing around, that is not improvisation, that is noise. If a, if a jazz master who knows how the notes are supposed to be organized and has learned the discipline, picks up a saxophone and starts messing around, it's genius. <laughs> yeah. But that's because he, you know, the jazz master knows the structure and has the discipline and knows how to work within that structure to create and to be creative. Well, this um, and I think that's something that people don't understand. Yeah, and I, I, I think you bring up a good point because discipline is seen in our culture as a, a really bad word. It's not a good thing. You know, as Americans, we pride ourselves on freedom. And with commercialism, we take freedom to the hilt. You know, you see the advertisement for the car parked by the beach with the beautiful water and the pretty people and everybody's happy. And so, you know, if I have that car, I'll have that freedom to have all my dreams fulfilled. Um, but it's in discipline that we find the freedom. It's in that routine, that rhythm. You know, I call it riding God's wave, you know, ride the wave. Cause mm -hmm. when you're in that current and your life is, is in that current, there is true freedom in that. So the freedom that we experience really, really is not the freedom that you see on TV. That really imprisons you. That's a very good point. So what are, what are some good things that, that you've seen? And, and you can, I know you've probably seen a lot because of your vantage point, more than most people would probably <laughs> realize. Um, but it would be good to hear like just a couple of, as we start to wind down our conversation, a couple of different um, examples of some good news, some good things you've seen happen or come out of this. And, you know, even though it's a crisis and there's been lots of bad things and, and anxiety and struggle, what are some good positive things you've seen? Well, you know, the first thing I would say is the sense of community whether in our schools or in society in general. You've seen the news reports where, you know, the people go to the hospitals and they're flashing their car lights or they sing at a certain time or I think in Italy they're banging pots and pans. Um, but they're doing things in support and celebration for those who struggle. And that goes from my perspective to the, the root goodness of our humanity. You know, we are, we are created in God's image. So there's a goodness at the very base. It gets corrupted by the brokenness of the world and our families and all those things that impact us over time. And many times it's, it's chipped away at, but at the very base, there is this beauty and goodness because we're created in God's image. And we, we see that happening in so many different ways with neighbors coming out, you know, I, Take, I don't like to take walks in the parks. I like to take walks through neighborhoods and different things. Having ADD, I really need a different place every time. Otherwise, I get bored real quick. So, you know, I see neighbors sitting out and, you know, socializing and talking and community building. In the schools, it, it has been remarkable to see the amazing teachers go way out of their way in order to connect with students, live streaming with students, making sure that that connectivity they had at the, during that school day is still there. And they're doing it, you know, not because anybody told them, but because the love they have for their kids. Yeah. 
also technology has technology's been there for quite some time and we've always wanted our schools to advance further and further in technology and you know when you have you know 1200 teachers <clears throat> and then on top of that hundreds of teachers aides and and so forth the the skill set for technology is really a broad spectrum so you you know you have the ones that are coming out of school now and they're used to technology you have older more veteran teachers that may not be as comfortable. This whole situation just took us and threw us 10 years ahead. So everybody's comfortable with technology now. And infusing technology as a tool, not a replacement, because you'll never replace the human experience, but as a tool has now transformed us and learning will always be different because of it. Um, and in the mountain, you know, in the mission and at San Pedro, this is a prime example. What we're doing today at San Pedro would not have occurred prior to the pandemic. So quickly, you know, we met, we retooled San Pedro for virtual uh, ministry, which I think will always now be a certain part of San Pedro as we move forward, you know, not just ministering to the people that walk onto the ground, but the Reaching people out. who walk on ground in general, um, mm -hmm. wherever they may be. So I think it's helped us look beyond the boxes that we've been comfortable with because we're familiar with and forced us to see the possibility anew. That's a really, that's a really great kind of way to look at it. And especially from your vantage point, you see so much that you can kind of, you know, like hone in on what are some of the things that are very key. So for our last kind of uh, point to, to talk about a little bit, how can, how can we, how can the folks out there who will either, who are either with us now or will see this later, um, what are ways in which they can support and serve you and your ministry and the people you serve? Well, I think in the education secretariat, I think there's there, the highest um, need, I think, would be our mission office. Because that mission office operates on one second collection a year, totally. And wow. then any revenue that's generated from missioners going down to work with the people. So we've stopped all missioners going down and we're not sure when that will resume. We're hoping maybe this fall, um, but this fall we also have our second collection in October. And we also know that many people have been financially impacted by this. So we've lost revenue from our missioners going down and I'm sure our second collection for the year will be down dramatically. And we operate on a balanced budget. So whatever we collect, you know, that's a, the number of people we can serve. So we, we have, even though we're experiencing hard times, it's pales in comparison to the hard times they're experiencing because we can still turn on our water faucet. We get sick, we can go to the hospital. There is no right. hospital in the mountains. There is no clinic. Um, you know, there's, there's intermittent electricity if they have that. There's no internet connectivity. It's been down for months. Um, there's no running water. So, you know, the experience is very different. Um, with our schools, we are working with our local governments to make sure that as they're looking to support the local public schools, that they don't forget about us as well. You know, we serve the public just like government funded public schools and our parents pay tax dollars as well. And so being able to make sure that our politicians, our legislators, don't forget that if we did not exist, the public schools could not take all our kids. You know, just in, in the state of Florida, we have almost 100,000 Catholic school kids. The public schools are already overcrowded. There's no way for them to take our kids. And that's just the Catholic schools. There's thousands of other private, you know, non-public schools as well. So that's an important way that people listening can help us as well by advocating and making sure that we're not forgotten about. I think, I think those are, um, those are really important things for people to be aware of and, and kind of, you know, I think the spirit of your secretariat in general, and I think most ministry is that we, or all ministry, is that we're supposed to journey with each other in, in this process. And one of the things mm -hmm. that I find, you know, it's, it's hard to go where you don't know where you're going. And right now there's a lot of kind of, like, okay, we made it through this part of it. 
what's next, what's going to happen in August, what's going to happen in October. And for, for me, one of the things that I've benefited from in during this time is talking to people is we're all, it's so hard to get everybody on the same page. <laughs> it feels like everybody <laughs> is in the same, like as the Pope said in his thing, they're in the same boat. We're all kind of floating around in our different like areas of, of, of responsibility kind of what's next, you know, what do we do next? So it's good to have a connection to people like yourself that are out there leading and, and, and doing it with everybody and not on your own. Um, because that's one of, that's the hardest thing when you're not certain where you're going, it, it's really hard to feel trust and, and ease with journeying together. So I think it's important to have people in, in, in our ministry leadership who are very apt at connecting with others, making sure they're communicating so that people don't feel kind of left behind. Like, how come I don't know where we're going? And, and you're very good about saying, don't worry, it's not just you. We will figure it out. And I think that that's what... You know, a comment you made just now, I think ultimately, if we break it down to the lowest common denominator, at the end of the day, we are all going in the same direction, in the same place towards God. And so using that as the foundation of we're moving forward and we're moving forward in trust with God and we're all going to get through this. And even if God forbid, we don't make it through it in this lifetime because of the illness, we are going to get through this and still be with God, whether here or in heaven. And so for me, that helps to alleviate some of the anxiety and then say, okay, let's figure out the details of what we got to do to get through the tomorrow. Well, I can't think of a better ending than that. So I think that will be our closing prayer. Um, thank you so much. I know how crazy busy you are. So I appreciate oh, you pleasure. sitting down and, and doing this with us. And to all of you who joined us, thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and stop the recording and stop the live stream so that everything kind of like settles itself. Thanks for joining us. And if you know people who might be interested in this, please share it with them. We're going to leave, it'll be available on Facebook Live so you can share it with others. And um, we'd love to hear any feedback you have. So thanks everyone. And we will see you again soon. Thank Bye. you. Thank God you. Bless.